Welcome to Hope for Today Fellowship, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. This is the AM service for February 21st. Um, we're so glad you're here. I just want to share um, a couple verses before we get to singing. Um, the song that we're going to start with is called Another in the Fire. And um, it's got some pretty powerful lyrics when, when you really um, think about it. And um, so I just wanted to start by um, reading a few verses in Daniel. Uh, many of you might know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were um, in Babylon, they were exiles there, and um, they were still trying to honor God and serve um, God even during that, that time of exile. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he erected a statue of himself, and he commanded that everybody was going to have to bow down to it when they heard the music playing. Well, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could not do that um, because they were faithful to the Lord their God. Um, so in Daniel 3, 16 to 18, um, is the part where Nebuchadnezzar he, he calls them and uh, asks them, like, he basically gives them an ultimatum. You can bow down to this and live, or you don't, and you're going to die um, in a fiery furnace. So this is verse 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. So he gets pretty mad, and he commands that they be thrown in, Verse 24 to 25 says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. So now it comes more clear what this song is named after, Another in the Fire. God Almighty was there with them, and um, he saved them from that fire. And, and I um, have also been thinking about the reference here to uh, the Red Sea and how the Israelites, they crossed over through the Red Sea while the Egyptians were chasing after them. And God was in front of them and behind them, and he protected them. And how we can hold on to these examples of his awesome love and faithfulness in our lives. And that um, no matter what we're going through, what we might be standing against, um, he's with us, and he loves us, he won't leave us. And um, we can trust him. Um, so let's, let's sing. And um, I just pray that all of our faith is, is challenged and built up today as we remember all that he's done and, and uh, remember that he wants to do these things in our lives as well. There's a grace when the Lord is under fire. Thank you. 
I'm 
you are moving in our midst. And you are our God who cares for us and bends our hearts and, and sees our aches, our pains, our, our suffering, our, our trials. Lord, and you will lead us where we are. Thank you, Jesus. Fill us with faith, oh God. Let faith arise right now. Let us believe you for what we need. Let us trust you, Jesus. We want to hear from you today, Lord God. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts, Lord God. Give us ears to listen what your Holy Spirit would say to us today.
chapter one, but uh, fascinating, fascinating stuff here. I'm just, I'm thoroughly enjoying it and I hope you are too. It's so good I've been taking notes. But uh, let's, um, let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a, a beautiful sunny day and we thank you Lord for your love and your forgiveness and your mercy. We thank you for your grace, amazing grace. Lord, we thank you so much for what you've done for us for the things you're doing for us and the things you're going to do for us. You are amazing. But it's not just about what you're doing for us, it's how you're transforming our lives into the very image of Christ. We were created to be in his image. And, and, and Lord, that, that image was marred by sin. And, and so your Holy Spirit is working in us and through us and, and, and changing us. What a beautiful thought to be transformed into the image of Christ. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father God. 
As we look into your word this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. Oh God, teach us. Teach us. We have so much to learn. Some of us even think that, you know, we've been attending fellowship for 45 years, and so there we, we've made it. And we haven't. There's so much to learn. It's so wonderful. We never get bored. We never run out of things to learn. It's fantastic. Your Bible is a textbook that never ends. Thank you. And thank you for our teacher, the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for Brian Graham. We pray for his health. We pray that you touch him and you give him strength. We pray, Lord, that you would heal him. We pray, Father, more than anything, that he would stay close to you during this time. Father, we pray for all of well, we pray for everybody because we're all locked in. We're all locked down. And we pray, Lord, that we would uh, find this time to, to uh, get closer to our spouses and to our families. Lord, that we wouldn't use this opportunity to grow further away from them. But, Father, give us patience. Give us love. Oh, God, we thank you so much for this, for this time of COVID. For I've heard many wonderful things that have come from it. Uh, I, I, I don't want to go through it again, but, but Father, for those things that have happened, those miracles that we've seen during this time, we give you praise and we thank you. Thank you so much. Father, for those who've lost loved ones just recently, pour out your peace and your comfort upon them. Help them through this time. What a terrible time to lose a relative when you, you can't be there with them, you can't see them, you can't say goodbye. Oh God, give these people comfort and peace in this time. But Father, may it also be an opportunity for them to look to you. Oh, we thank you. Speak to us now through your word, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I was concerned that maybe I was taking a bit too long praying, and then I thought, Y'all got nowhere to go. So anyway, um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. Um, uh, by the way, we have um, no programs going on at the church right now except for Bread of Hope, um, uh, the, the food pantry. It's open on Tuesdays from uh, 11 till 1, every Tuesday. Everybody's welcome. You don't need proof of a residency, whatever, whatever the local food bank wants. You don't need that. We just want you to show up. It's a drive-through, so you don't have to come in the building. You don't have to, to breathe on people or breathe, get breathed on. Um, and so we want you to show up. Um, if, you, if you are in need, please come for the food. If you know someone that's in need, please direct them to the food pantry. It's at the fellowship on Tuesdays, 11 till 1. Thank you for, thank you for uh, all your help with that. And um, we also have um, Narcotics Anonymous is, is running still. Um, they're, they're in a limited number. The government's only letting them, I think it's 10 people they're still allowed to have. But uh, unnecessary, a very essential service, very essential service. And we saw what happened last time. It shut down, it locked down, and uh, many people uh, fell off the wagon. It was a, it was a bad, uh, bad scene. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Narcotics Anonymous at Hope for Today Fellowship. And uh, if you know someone that needs to go, or you know someone that... Uh, that, uh, or, or it's you that needs to go, so um, uh, please join us there. I'm hoping that fellowship's going to open up soon. I, I think that February 20th or 25th is supposed to be the end of this, but I keep hearing like they're going to drag it on for another month, so I don't really know. I don't have a date for you, but when I get one, I'll let you all know. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's when Jesus returns. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance when you were without God. Don't be conformed to that pattern. But as he who called you is holy, as your heavenly Father called you to be holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Not just your conduct on Sundays when you're with other followers of followers of Jesus Christ. Don't just make it a Sunday thing. In all your conduct, when you're at work, when you're with your family, when you're at school, whatever you're doing, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
just as our Heavenly Father is holy, we are to be holy too. And the Bible says in Hebrews 13, it says, without holiness, you will not see the Lord. This holiness thing is very important. But Peter said in the beginning, therefore prepare your minds for action. Living the way that God wants us to means that we must prepare our minds for action. We must, we must get our minds ready. We got to get rid of all the loose sloppy thinking that's going on in our minds and we need to bring our minds under control. Under control. But, but I heard somebody just a while ago, they were talking to me about meditation. And they said, how important? Oh, meditation is so important. And it is. It is. But not the kind of meditation where you just empty your mind of everything and, and, and think on some mantra. That's, that's not what we're talking about. The Bible says, meditate on the Word day and night. Meditate on the Bible. The things of, if you're not reading the Word of God, what are you filling your mind with? It, we need to get rid of all that sloppy, loose thinking that's going on in our heads, and we need to, to get control of our minds. It means to control what we think about. Those things that we set our minds on. Set your minds, therefore, on the things above. It's what we... It's what we should set our minds... Colossians 3, 2. I just said that. That's weird. Uh, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. Think on those things of God. Don't think on the things of this world. Well, well what does that mean exactly? Well, the, the definition of that is in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is excellent, all these things, think about these things. That's what we should be thinking about. We shouldn't be thinking about all the other garbage that's going on around us. We should be thinking about these things, heavenly things, not things of the earth. So we have, we have our minds set. They're, they're ready and they're under control. But what are they set for? Well, Peter tells us they're set for action. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. That's what we're preparing our minds for, is the action. This whole idea, this is like the phrase that we use, uh, roll up your sleeves. You know, let's get to work, let's roll up our sleeves. Get ready for action. And then he says, we must also be sober-minded. Which means we must have the ability to take a serious look at life. You gotta, listen, more than anybody else, I love a good joke. I love to goof around. I like to be immature. Um, but we have to be sober-minded. We have to have a serious look at life. Sober-minded means a condition that is free from every form of mental and spiritual loss of self-control. That's what it means. It's an attitude of self-discipline that avoids the extremes. To be sober-minded is to be focused and not distracted. We need to be focused on what? On the things above. We need to be focused on the soon return of Jesus Christ. We need to be focused on the important things. Not on the, not on the piddly things, the things of this earth, but the things of eternity. Set your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus returns... Hey, we got grace now, we, we, we've got grace in the past, and we're going to have more grace, more grace when Jesus returns. Set your hope fully upon that grace, the grace of God. Don't set your hope on anything else because anything else is going to disappoint you. I know, I know that there's lots of people, even in our congregation, who love to go to the store and, and, and buy a lottery ticket. You're setting your hope on something, but it's not Jesus Christ. It's not the grace of God. You're setting your hope on, on winning. Man, if God wants you to be wealthy, you'll be wealthy. If he doesn't want you to be, you won't be. It, it, it's not a case of you might get the lucky ticket. It might be the worst thing that ever happened to you. Set your hope not on something of this world. Don't set your hope on your family. Don't set your hope on your beautiful car. Set your hope on the grace that is to be revealed to us when Jesus returns. Peter's told us a lot about God's grace. He greeted us at the very beginning of Peter. He greeted us with the grace of God. 
He told us that grace is, is to come to us in Jesus Christ when he returns. And now he goes further. He's, he's writing of the grace that is brought to us. It's brought to us. So we have, we have grace when, when we got saved. We got saved by the grace of God. It was something we didn't deserve. He saved us from the wrath of God. It was something we didn't deserve. That was grace. Today we stand in the grace of God. But in the future, more grace will come to us. Jesus is bringing back more grace. Grace, we can't even understand how much grace we're talking about. <laughs> According to the riches of his grace in Christ, his, his glory, his, his treasures. Oh, God wants to give us what we don't deserve. The only way we'll be able to stand before Jesus on that day when he returns is because of the unmerited faith, the unmerited favor, the, 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 what we don't deserve, the grace of God, the things we don't deserve. That's why we're going to stand before Jesus. Not because anything we've done, there's nothing we can possibly do to justify us to stand before Christ on Judgment Day. There's nothing we can do. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. We don't deserve God's peace. We don't deserve His gifts. We don't deserve His love, His joy, His eternal life. We don't deserve any of that. In fact, we deserve the opposite. We deserve death. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard, His glory. We've all, we've all sinned. All of us. It, it says, For all have sinned. Each one of us. It's not that we did something bad, okay? If you think you're a good person, that's fine. But you rejected Jesus Christ. At some point in our lives, we've all rejected Jesus Christ, and now we need to be reconciled to Him. That's our sin. We're all sinners, and because we're sinners, we deserve death. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We deserve death. But, but look at God's grace. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's grace. We're going to get what we don't deserve. God's going to give me eternal life, but I deserve eternal death. Oh, that's so beautiful. So grace isn't just for the past when I was born again. It isn't only for the future where I live and stand each day. But it's also for the future when grace will be brought to us. Through Jesus Christ. Amazing. Well, that's why we call it amazing grace. Amazing grace. Grace is what God does because he's gracious. That's what grace is. Grace is what God does because he's a gracious God. Look at Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before Moses, and he proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God is gracious. Every action of God towards us involves his grace. His creation, he made that for us. He, create, he created the earth and all the beauty of this earth and the intricacies of this earth. He created for our good pleasure. That's what the Bible says. That's his grace. We don't deserve that. His providence. He's in control of all things. He, he works all things together for the good of those who love Christ. As he conforms us into Christ's image. That's grace. His conviction of the sinner. The way the Holy Spirit convicts sinners. Convicts all of us of our sin. That's grace. And then there's his gift of salvation and his equipping of the saints. He gives us all gifts. Everybody gets a gift or gifts to use to serve in the body of Christ. It's God's grace. This is all due to God's amazing grace. While God's grace is about much more than our salvation or being, being born again, being saved from the wrath of God, it perhaps is the most outward and visible indication of God's grace. Salvation is the most visible and outward indication of God's grace. When we see my, Derek and I were talking this week about somebody who, who we, we watched them get, get saved. We watched the Holy Spirit transform their life. And, and they are just totally new. They are totally new. And, and they went from, from, from ugly, like 
a just mean, vicious person into, into a, a beautiful, loving, caring person. And, and that's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. Paul says in Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in our sin, in our trespasses, Christ made us alive. God made us alive together with Jesus. By grace you have been saved. It's by grace that we've been saved. It's nothing we've done. It's nothing we deserve. It's undeserved. We've been saved by grace. Ephesians 2.8 continues. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, this salvation, this, this being saved, it, it's not of your own doing. It's, it's a gift of God. You didn't do anything to be saved. You can't do anything. None of us can do anything to be, to be saved. This, there's no way. But what Christ did for us, that's what saved us. It was his grace. Our salvation is not because of anything we've done. It's because of what Jesus offered to us when he hung on a cross. So being born again comes to us only by grace. But God's grace doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. That's not the end of it. Followers of Jesus are impacted by God's grace in, in three different ways. First off, we're impacted by God's grace by the way we are justified to stand in grace. Right now I stand before you in grace. Justified means the action of declaring or making righteous in the sight of God. I am justified because of what Christ did on the cross. I've been justified by faith in Christ. Paul tells us Romans 5, 1 to 2. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. See, we stand in grace right now. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Our position before God is a matter of His grace. We come into relationship with God because of His grace. We continue to be in a relationship with God because of His grace. How amazing is it to be able to know and experience God's unfavored, unmerited favor in our lives. Every day we experience that amazing grace. And we will on into eternity. Number two, we are impacted by God's grace by the way we are equipped with spiritual giftedness. Each one of us has a gift from God. The Holy Spirit gives gifts as He sees fit. You will receive a gift if you haven't already. If you're born again, you've got a gift. You've got many gifts. 1 Peter 4.10 as each has received, see, as each has received a gift. You, you've each received, anyone who's a follower of Jesus Christ has received a spiritual gift. And that gift is to be used to serve one another in the body of Christ. As good stewards of God's varied grace. We use the gifts that God's given us. I'm going to have the gift of encouragement. So I go around and I encourage my brothers and sisters. I use that. Being a good steward means I'm using it, and I'm using it the way it's supposed to be used. That's a wonderful thing. God equips us with spiritual gifts. Here we find Peter telling his readers to be faithful stewards of God's grace, using our gifts to serve one another. Grace is reflected in our lives through his equipping of the followers of Jesus to serve. When people look at us, they should see our giftedness. We're not showing off, but they should see the grace of God working in our lives. Our gifts vary from person to person, and potentially over time. Some people would have a gift, and, 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 and God might change that gift at some point. The Holy Spirit gives gifts as He sees fit, for as much time as He sees fit. But both Paul and Peter agree that God equips us for the good of the body, the bride of Christ, the church. Those people that are in, in fellowship with God. That's, that's why we have these gifts. Our spiritual gifts are a reflection of God's grace for the overall body of Christ. God is working within us to grow the body and to help it to function as a body. Number three. We're impacted by God's grace by the way we are 
growing strong in the grace of God. 2 Timothy 2.1 You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Yet Paul instructs Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace doesn't just come to a lucky few. It's available to all of those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And it's given to all of those who are followers of Jesus Christ. When I'm in relationship with Jesus, God's grace surrounds me. But just because it surrounds me doesn't mean that I either experience it or enjoy it. Because the truth is, Peter says, be strong in God's grace. It requires exercise to be strong. You have to work it. Peter told us to be strong. Therefore, it's obviously there's something we must do to be strong in God's grace. Recognize that God is for you. That he wants what's in your best interest. That's, that's how God's working. Believe that he is on your He's on your long-term best interest. He's got that in mind. Your long-term best interest. He's, he's working for you. He's on your side. We have to work hard to remember that and to know that because we need to grow in that grace. We need to grow strong. We must let go of ourselves, of doing things our way. We need to start depending on God and His resources, not ours. We can't depend on that lottery ticket. We can't depend on our credit cards. We can't depend on ourselves for every breath we take. We can't depend on ourselves for longevity of life. That's all in God's hands. We need to learn to depend on Him, to grow strong in His grace. It's all about grace. There's no aspect of God's dealing with His creation that does not involve His grace. A gracious God cannot fail to demonstrate grace in all He does. If He's a gracious God, He's gracious in all things. That I exist is through His grace. That the sun shines and the rain falls is due to His grace. My salvation, my standing with God, my eternal future with Him, it's all because of His amazing grace. Even God's justice and eternal punishment for those who reject Him. It reflects His grace. God gives every opportunity to repent, to turn away from sin, to turn to Him. He gives us every opportunity because He's gracious. But in His grace, He does not force Himself on anyone. There will be people who go to hell because they choose to go there. And God's not going to force a stop. He's going to let you choose. You've got free will. Praise God for all His encompassing grace, for His all-encompassing grace. His grace that reached even one like me. And His grace that keeps me safe and secure in Him, both now and through eternity. It's all about God's overwhelming grace. It's all about His grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. How sweet it is. How sweet it is. It saved a wretch like me. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for your amazing grace, for I stand in it every day. It, the reason I have breath is because of your amazing grace. And I thank you for your amazing grace, because when Jesus returns... It's going to be poured out upon me. I'm going to be spending eternity with Jesus Christ. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're listening today, if you're, if you're watching the video, and this is the first, maybe you've understood grace to some extent. I mean, there's a lot more to it. But, but maybe this is the first time you've really sat and thought about how much God loves you. How he wants to pour out his grace upon you. Listen, if that's you, if that's you, here's what we need to remember. We're all sinners. We've all sinned. We can't save ourselves. We need a rescuer. That's why Jesus Christ came to earth to die, take our sin upon himself. We need a rescuer. And then the Bible says if we confess our sin to God, He's faithful and just. He will forgive our sin 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our guilt will be cleansed. Think about that. How beautiful is that? That is a gracious God. That is a gracious God. If you want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you want your sins forgiven and your guilt taken away, if you want to start following Jesus and enjoying the grace that he wants to pour out on you every day, then what you need to do is you need to admit you're a sinner. Tell God, say, I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I need a rescuer. I need Jesus Christ. And then you go to God and you say, God, forgive me for my sin. And he will forgive you and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then at that point, at that point, he pours out his grace upon you. And he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's God the Holy Spirit is going to come and live inside of you. He's going to dwell in you. And, and from that point on, you've got the helper. You've got the comforter. The God himself is living within you. And now it's a day of grace every day. Every day. Father, if there's people listening right now that want to give their life to you, I pray in Jesus' name that you would give them the strength and the courage to do that right now. I know Satan's trying to keep them from doing this. Satan wants them. He likes to, he likes to destroy as many lives as he can, but you want to give life. Father, through your Holy Spirit, convict of sin, convict of sin, that each one of us would remember we're sinners. We can't save ourselves. Oh God, speak to these people. Work in their hearts and their lives. And those of us, those of us, Lord, who are followers of Jesus, oh God, that we would start to understand your grace more. And we would be thankful for your grace and how gracious a God you are. We would think on these things. Marvelous, Lord, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you all the praise, all the glory. You are a mighty God, a gracious God, a loving God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please join us again tonight at 6 o'clock. We have service again. I guess it doesn't matter if you're watching on YouTube. But uh, anyway, we do have a different service tonight. And uh, we'll continue on in our study. Thank you very much. Have a good day.